We're going to have a, a kind of a guided conversation uh, with some of the students who won last year's Aspen Challenge in Los Angeles. Uh, a chance for you to kind of pick their brains and to see what it was that they think made them successful. But also, I would suggest maybe a chance to learn from others' mistakes as well. Uh, if you want to understand how the last year's winners did it and what their projects were about and how they went about it and what they think impressed the judges, this is your chance to talk to them and have them talk to you. So please join me in welcoming all of them, my LA peeps. <laughs> and uh, Natalie, who you met just in the last session, is going to kind of guide this for us. So I'm going to turn the stage and the sound over to uh, Natalie. Let's hear it. Well, to begin, this is a really wonderful and rare opportunity. These guys. They were our first guinea pigs with this program, and they rocked it. Therefore, we're so lucky that you have an opportunity to ask them questions. We're going to start just by talking about what they did. I have a couple questions about different successes or challenges they may have had, and then we'll open it to Q&A. So to begin, we'll start with Westchester. Tell us what you did what challenge you selected, uh, what your solution was, in short. Uh, just go for it, summarize it. Um, so we are Westchester Rich Science <laughs> Magnet, sorry. And we chose the Kristen Bruce Challenge. It was originally the Revolution Foods. And the challenge was to leverage un underutilized resources of your school's community to create a place where you and your peers can come together in an, in in an interest of creating a I don't know what that says, but a food environment in your school's community. So basically, we created an aquaponics farm on our school's campus. It's an, an organic producing farm that uses fish to fish waste to fertilize the nutrients of plants and vegetables in the garden. So, so it's, it's recyclable, and we just, um, it's, it's part of our greenhouse, so we have fruits and vegetables, and our ultimate goal is to create a farmer's market for our, not only our school's community, but the environment around our school because a lot of the students in our school come from outside the Westchester neighborhood, so they don't have access to the healthy foods that the Westchester community does. Nice. All right. Round of applause. <laughs> and I would love for our ocean people to share with us, downtown Magnets High School, what they addressed and what they designed. Okay, so our team chose David Gallo's um, challenge to create ocean aware awareness in our communities. So through that, we created an organization called Ocean LA. And the mission of it is to get uh, people to organize with their communities, change their daily, daily behavior, engage themselves in our movement, and act now. So what we basically did is we went out to our communities. Um, we wanted to focus on the inner city because we live in downtown and because most of the people in the city think that they have no impact on the ocean. Uh, we went out to businesses. We made partnerships with them. We uh, made partnerships with over 30 businesses. Uh, we went to recreational centers and parks and cr we created our very own coloring book with a story um, telling like the kids about Tammy the turtle that had gotten, uh, would often see plastic in the ocean, teaching them to be more conscious about what they're doing. Um, we wanted to really reach out to all ages because any little difference, any uh, little thing makes a difference. So we, um, we wanted to inform our uh, inner city residents about the impact that they were creating on the ocean. Awesome. Our, our coach, Mr. Joth, Daniel, yeah. um, was holding up a shirt. Do you mind telling everyone how you came up with your messaging? So the students were really the ones like, because we wanted to create like, you always get like free shirts and they're just whack that you never want to wear them because they're ugly. So we try to create something that represented like the inner city 
of Los Angeles with also the ocean kind of coming out at a distance and then our kind of what, what Ocean LA stands for on the back. And so it was really cool because uh, the students created it using Photoshop. They got a couple quotes, so they were kind of getting the best price, you know, use your money wisely that you guys are gonna get from the Aspen Challenge. And then people are still wearing them, which is a, a sign of, you know, that it's something that they actually are proud to wear and a cause that they are, are still conscious about. So it was all student created. Janelle, do you mind saying what Ocean stands for? If people can't read it. So Ocean LA stands for Organize, Change, Engage, and Act Now Los Angeles. Great, thank you. And I didn't catch, did you say the name of your um, project? Cultivate. Do you want to tell them how you came up with oh that? Gosh. First, so the first part. I'll do it. Okay, thank you. Jordan. Okay, so we came up with, well, our original name was Wesson Girls, but we felt that the acronym was way too long. So we were throwing around ideas, and I came up with Germinate, but they didn't like that. So they took um, the eight part and started coming up with words that ended with eight, because eight is the past tense of eat, and we're growing vegetables, and we want people to eat them. So our principal came up with cultivate, because we're cultivating the vegetables from the garden, and we still have the eight part that I came up with. It's always about children. So I have another question now. Less than a year ago, because we launched in February with them. You were in all of these students' shoes, preparing to select your challenge to design your solution. You did it. What's the one piece of advice? Maybe we'll go down the road that each of you would have. Okay. So we started off um, with a whole bunch of uh, different personalities in our team, so we all wanted different challenges, but if you guys are confused about what you're doing, I suggest um, doing more research about the topics that you're interested in, and sooner or later you'll grow more passionate about it, and you can see that in your work, and basically to just take advantage of this opportunity um, that you can make a difference in your community because you're given all of the tools and resources that you need to do this, and just take the opportunity. <laughs> okay, um, so I would say that once you guys choose your challenge, you guys are going to realize that because there's so many people in your group, everyone's gonna want something different. And something that we learned that was super important is communication is key. Like you're gonna have to uh, compromise. Not everyone is always gonna get what they want, but you guys have to make sure that what you create in the end is, has a piece of what everyone wanted because everyone's going to have something very important to input. Okay, I think the most important advice is understand that this is a serious commitment. I mean, it's not just something that we threw together overnight. We really put in work for this project and it's a lot of people working together and tensions will run high, but as long as you persist, it will pay off. Um, for me, the best advice I would give to you guys is to network as much as you can. So once you choose your, your challenge, it's best to get advice from all over the people who have interest in your fields. For example, Westchester, we met with local restaurant owners in our community. We met aquaponic farm experts. We got as much inside and information that would help us you know, create our own solution to our problem. So I think in the long run, the more we gain outreach from other people, the more we are more successful with finding the solution. Um, as a coach, I would say um, to get your school involved. The eight of us on each on our teams didn't just do the project alone. We, we had help from the school, um, whether it was from other teachers, other students, even parents got involved. Reach out. So you more basically represent your school and you're putting your school on the map. That's how we looked at it. And it was a hands-on process in building our aquaponic garden, and we didn't build it alone. It really took over 200 people to help us put it together. So I would say definitely don't think that you're carrying the weight of the project on your, your own shoulders of the eight people on the team, but get your students in, at your schools involved. Yeah, that's really great advice, because you have eight people and you go back to your campus and everyone's gonna be like, oh, what are these eight kids talking about? You want it to feel like something the community and the students are all kind of a part of. I would say, um, for, for me, is, is have fun, because for, as teachers, to the coaches out there, there's very few opportunities where you actually treat it in such a 
uh, way as the Aspen and the Bezos family has treated us throughout this process, from the good food, the beautiful decor, and the support from Natalie and her staff and everybody. So just kind of seize the moment. It's hard when you're in the classroom and you're teaching, and then now you have this other thing. This thing is amazing. And it, for the three teams that get to go to Aspen, it will change your life. I'm still like flick, clicking on the photos going, I want to go back, like lost, you know. Let's go back to the island, you know. But uh, it's for the dorks out there that watch Lost. I, I'm one of those. Okay. Uh, my next question for you, and I'll do this based on a team so you guys can delegate which team member you'd like to contribute. You had seven weeks to select a challenge, design a solution, implement it, engage your community, build a presentation about this whole process and what you accomplished, and present it to a panel of distinguished judges. What was the most challenging piece of this process and how did you address it? You want to go? Okay. So I think that there are two things that we are expected to do throughout this challenge is to do the work and to present the work. And um, the challenges that we faced as a team was um, were we sort of doubted ourselves at the beginning because we weren't we were unsure if. Um, it was acceptable what we were doing, if it was good enough. But then how we resolved it, we, we talked to each other and we realized that we could use our voices, um, our unique perspectives to our advantage. And t in presenting the work, it was really difficult um, to, because of the minimal time that we're given. Um, we had to sort of tell a story that we um, experience throughout those seven weeks into 10 minutes and it was really compact and stressful but we put all of these creative things together we used um, singing and videos scary and comedy and we just put it together and made it entertaining and educational at the same time okay cool. so even though yes the presentation is hard I feel like the hardest thing for our team was you have eight teenagers all together and specifically with our team we all came from leadership classrooms so this is all type a personalities and everybody's like it's my way or the highway and we were stepping on each other's toes because we all wanted something different and when we did agree it's like it didn't work for what we were trying to do and we had the reason we actually got through this is because miss malay she had to bring us back down to earth and remind us that the goal is aspen and so we had to compromise so yes, we each got something out of it that we wanted, but it wasn't completely ours, I guess. If that makes sense. What do you mean? Like, yeah, it, it was, it was the, the presentation represented the group as a whole. So no one person got to design how we were going to present the information, how the script was gonna go, who was saying what we all got together and contributed information and then we divided it up based on the abilities that we each had mm -hmm. as individuals. So you're talking about teamwork. Yes, teamwork, <laughs> communication. Um, so I have one more question then. And this is on a team basis. How have you made your solution sustainable and what are you working on now? Ariel, do you want to start? Oh, okay. oh. Um, so with the aquaponic farm on our campus, sorry. Um, we decided to have it um, as a part of our school's curriculum. So we have a business class that's working on the business plan for the farmer's market that we plan to uh, start on our campus. We have uh, the woodshop class actually helps work on it now. They still build and still, you know, work in the garden with the other fruits and vegetables that are growing. So we, we have classes that go study the gar garden, that they harvest the fruits and vegetables and they really care for it. So. Every, it's student ran. Everybody takes care of the garden and it's always being used, used by the community. Yeah, so there's a class that our principal actually got with a uh, science teacher and created called a food and soil class. And the class goes out every Monday and Wednesday and they tend to the soil, plant new seeds, and harvest the, the fruits and vegetables that grow. And then they take those fruits and vegetables that do grow and turn them over to our culinary arts class. And the class uses those fruits and vegetables to cook with. So we're constantly recycling our products, and we also have teamed up with one of our mentors for the garden, David Rosenstein, who comes on a couple of Saturdays, and he actually teaches community members who are interested 
in how to actually create an aquaponic farm in their backyards or on their balconies or wherever they need to. And it's been pretty successful. The class is a little costly because he actually gives you hands-on experience and uses our garden to show the, the actual science behind it and how it works. So for about $500 on a Saturday, Saturday and Sunday, you can pretty much get everything you need to start your own garden, which I think over in the long run, it's worth it. Um, so for Ocean LA, what we're doing is it's kind of difficult to keep people motivated in trying to help uh, protect our oceans. So what we're doing is, well, we have a, a club in our school now. It's this first year. And we wanted to continue for them to continue doing what we did when we were doing the challenge. So continue reaching out to businesses, continue reaching out to organizations that are like us, that want to help protect the ocean. We want to uh, keep impact on our communities and not only reach out to the communities around our school, but continue spreading out so that Ocean LA can continue. Great. I have one question, not scripted, because we don't have principal representation up here. However, I know the principals were highly engaged with your teams as, and with the third team, Taft, who are unable to be with us. How much of a difference does it make? How, how engaged do you think principals need to be? I think they need to be highly engaged. I, I was really sad that our principal couldn't be here because in addition to myself, I feel like he was the initial driving force behind all of this. He's a very competitive man, and he really wants our school to be represented because there are a lot of people that occasionally doubt our school because we are the only school in our school district that has an African-American population over 75%. And so a lot of the people in our community sometimes tend to doubt our school because of our dynamics. And he's an advocate for us all. And he had a hands-on role in making sure that he chose me. I didn't have a choice. He said, you're going to do this. And also allowing the students, they actually got to hang out in the principal PCR. He bought them snacks. And he checked in regularly. If he wasn't able to make it, he would text a message. Um, he would email. So he was very hands-on. And I think that from a principal standpoint, that you're the key, the glue that holds the school and the teachers and the students together. And I hope that all the principals get involved and actually meet with the students and give them your support. I, I had the opposite experience. And not that I have a bad principal. Our, my principal, he's no longer at our school, but he was excellent. But what, he wasn't really involved in what we were doing. But what he did do is he just believed in the ability of the students and myself to run this program. And he checked in and he genuinely was concerned about what we were doing because principals in the room, I'm sure you're very busy people. And so he wasn't hands on in what we were doing, but he was more than happy to find ways that I can come to the, the events. And, and, you know, if there was time in the school schedule that we needed to kind of use up for something we wanted to do, he was very keen on making that happen. So you don't have to be hands on, but I think you have to support what the teachers and the students are trying to do. So we, um, we want to leave some time for Q&A. So what I'd love is we'll go down the road. We'll start with you. Um, and just share your most memorable moment working together. OK. So I think the most memorable moment with my team was when we first went out to an event called Art Walk in downtown LA. And we were there to hand out surveys and collect them and ask people about um, what they think their impact on the ocean is. And it was really, it was, it was memorable because it was a time where we approached people and we were scared of rejection, but we still went for it as a team and we came back together and it was actually successful and we learned a lot from the strangers that we encountered and from one another. Um, personally, my most memorable moment was the first time we presented. Um, it was the, uh, we presented twice or three times at the competition, but it was the first time and we were all so scared, unbelievably scared. We were shaking, we were stuttering, we didn't know if we were going to remember what to say. But I remember that before getting on, we all just kind of stood in a circle and like held hands and like we knew it, it was going to be all right. We went out and we did what we had to do and afterwards it was just such a sense of relief because we knew regardless of the outcome we knew we were passionate about what we were doing and that we had done our absolute best 
Um, the most memorable moment for me with my team was when we made the decision as a group of kids to not have it in our minds that we weren't going to win the competition. I mean, we, we were not allowed to say if we go to Aspen, if we win the competition. It was when we go to Aspen, when we win. So I feel like always having that out there, putting it out into the universe, it, it really, it's a confidence booster. Uh, for me, my most memorable, memorable experience was working with my teammates in general. Like Ms. Malay said, we, sometimes we have to miss class or come out and go to the PCR of our principal's conference room and have meetings. And I think the camaraderie was really built between us. We were already friends, but it just strengthened our bond more so, and it helped us get through the struggles and the stress of filling out the project and getting our solution, but it just made us that much closer in family. My most memorable moment was actually seeing the kids hit the stage and do what we practice for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, I'm kind of like that mother figure at my school, and I really felt like a proud mom standing there in the back of the room watching them and just kind of tears in my eyes and just saying, we did it. You know, again, not, not really knowing if we were going to Aspen with that thought in the back of our minds that we were going to go to Aspen, but just knowing that our hard work paid, paid off. I could see the faces of the audience and the reactions of what we were presenting to the audience, and just seeing them make it happen was the most memorable moment. For me, uh, our team did not consist of like the best GPA students in our school. They were a random group of people. And uh, the cool moment was that we heard a lot this week, the last two days, about like you, you all are the leaders now, not tomorrow. And that became real for me when um, my students were saying, oh, we have a meeting with the city council uh, over on Tuesday, or we're actually going to the Aquarium of the Pacific on Saturday. And they were like scheduling things and talking to dignitaries. Uh, one of our students met the mayor and had him hold up our Ocean LA logo. So for me, it was that moment where I was like, I haven't done anything. <laughs> and they're making it happen. And they really, I think, for some of them, found their voice. And for all of you, you're going to find it. Like, and, and don't wait because, you know, next thing you know, it's March and you're here and you're nervous and you're jittering and you, you, you know, it, it, it's there. And it was cool to see eight students who may not have 75 AP classes uh, or a 4.5, like, do a remarkable thing in a city as big and, and diverse as Los Angeles. So if, if, I, if you could put your hands together, round of applause. Um, They have set the bar very high. Um, we do have uh, some time for Q&A. Uh, during the community engagement fair, each team will have a table, so you can go up to them and ask more questions if your question isn't answered at this time. OK, so uh, hands up if you have questions. And I'm going to kind of pick this time around so that we can get some. Uh, would you take that gentleman right there, please? And uh, next up will be that gentleman right there. If we have a second mic, great. Um, I'm DeAndre from Push Academy. I just wanted to know, like, what was y'all, uh, like, your hardest challenge that y'all had to go through? Hardest challenge? For Westchester, I think our hardest challenge was, like Jordan said, we were all leadership positions. I was junior class president, he was sophomore, we had, my sister was ASB president, we had the vice president, everybody had a position, everybody had egos. So I think blending the opinions and being open to the, um, the thoughts of others and the concerns of others was our biggest challenge because, like he said, it was our way or the highway. We really like thought like we were number one. Everybody thought they were number one. So I think humbling ourselves and realizing that we weren't as big as as big and bad as we thought our, ourselves were was our hardest challenge. Um, Ocean LA, do you want to go? Yeah, uh, I would just quickly say that like our biggest challenge would be, especially in the beginning, not doubting yourself. Um, in the beginning, we were like trying to figure out like what was the best thing we could do. We were like sort of worrying about what other teams could be doing, but you don't do like I would recommend not to do that. Just focus on your team, focus on yourself, focus on doing the best that you can, and you'll be good. Next question. My name is Trinia, 
And I just wanted to know how much community organizing did you guys do in school versus outside of school? Janelle, you want to start? Can you repeat your question, please? Um, I just wanted to know okay, how much community organizing did you guys do in school versus outside of school? Okay, so we sort of tied in both the community and school environment. We held several events and we visited different places, like we went to a Chinatown um, Easter fair where we went and talked to little kids and we gave out coloring books and we had a multicultural night at our school where we had our own mini presentation and we had inner city cleanups that not only invited students from our school but the people in our neighborhoods like we held, um, we posted up pictures and posters and in local businesses and places that people could see and come join us and we would use social media Facebook and Instagram um, to let everyone know what was happening where it was happening so we could bring everyone together and not just go to the community and to the school but um, together okay. both the community and the school May I ask you one question yeah do you want to share how many followers mm -hmm. you gained on Facebook okay on Facebook I believe it's 1,300 followers, and on Instagram, I think 800 followers. Thank you. Um. Um, I'll do Westchester. Jordan. So for Westchester, ours was mostly in school, like with the garden. That was purely student built. Like it was over 200 kids that came on Saturdays or after school or during their woodshop class that came and put this garden together. We also had like an expert from LMU who taught at LMU, which is right down the street from Westchester. He came with the water system, helping us what the temperature has to be for the fish to survive, all of that. So it was, it was a lot of work in school. And out of school. And out of school, yeah. Next question. She's right here. Sarah from George Washington High School, and we were wondering how you guys stayed organized. That implies we did. <laughs> <laughs> Ariel, can you pass the Honestly, we stayed organized as much as we could. We, we tried in the beginning to schedule meetings, so we said we'll have a meeting on Tuesday um, in our leadership class or after school or at lunch, and then we had, we'd say it'll be on Friday, but I mean, you just really have to work around people's schedules for the most part. Like, we all had to drop commitments to, cause, because this was a very big commitment for us, so I think to stay organized, you you just have to, yeah. You just have to, uh, I guess, guard your own self. You know, you have to put do what you do. Do your part first, and then the team and will follow through after. I think. So. Just to tag on to that, following having the playbook playbook was a huge part in that because it gives you step by step. It gives you like week one through seven. And as the coach, that was my role of making sure that if we didn't meet once a week or on certain days and times that at least every kid knew, okay, turn to this page, you're responsible for making sure that we get that activity done for that week in the playbook. One more question? No, we have two more. The two people holding the mics there and there, uh, we'll get to ask the last two. But let me point out that these teams will be up in the next section that you can talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. This isn't your only opportunity to speak with them. Okay, uh, my name is Catherine Garcia and I'm attend North High School. And my question was, did you get donations from outside sources other than the money that the Aspen Challenge gave to you? And how did you keep your presentation under five minutes? We had 10. Yeah, we had 10. I mean, five. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so for Westchester, I believe we got a $10,000 grant from the Water Buffalo Company, something like that, to build seating around our garden. It has not been done yet, but we are gonna build like amphitheater style seating so people can come out, watch how the garden works, be taught how the fish fertilize the plants, the plants filter the water for the fish, all that. Um, I don't know if we got any extra money besides that. It was the school, the farm was mostly funded by the school. We, you know, the, the good thing about like a lot of the challenges, you don't really need money. And I think that the $1,000 is great, but we found that even without it, we were going to be able to do what we wanted to do. And, um, and I think it's important, like, when you're going to these community organizations and these businesses, uh, they're so used to getting hit up for money. And if you can offer solutions or opportunities to collaborate that don't start with money, 
money will follow later. Like, so once we started doing all these things, next thing you know, people want to buy the t-shirts, they want to buy the bags, and they actually are, you know, keep the change, and next thing you know, we actually have money to do printing the posters, and if you come up to our booth, we'll show you what those posters look like, because we wanted to create, you, everyone's seen a poster saying, don't throw trash, but like, how do we capture young people that see a million images a day? So um, if you are creative and you're collaborative, people are gonna start coming to you, and then that's when the money uh, will, will appear. But we didn't, we didn't use anything except for what Aspen and the Bezos family generously gave us. And our final, we have a final question? Yep. Hi, I'm Suchi Verma from John F. Kennedy. Um, my question is for the people who did the garden, that you guys started in February, so it's probably still snowing. Well, here it is at least. Oh, welcome. But anyway, it's like... 70 degrees in yeah. right now. It's <laughs> hot right now. But anyway, like, it takes, like, a long time for, like, the garden to grow. Did, like, did you finish when it was, like, the time? No. No. We actually started learning about the process at the end of February of how it all worked, the whole science behind it. And from March, literally, until, I would say, August of this school year, the garden actually didn't open until after school started in August. And it's still not fully complete. Each week, the kids are still adding to it. But it's up and running where we are producing. But it's still a continuous process. So I, if I can add to that, many of the teams would pilot the, the seed of the idea, engage their community, watch it germinate. But as you can tell, they've made solutions that are self-sustaining. And they lived beyond that seven weeks. Just to add, we will have some pictures so you can see what it started and the kids actually use, our students actually use saws and nails and hammers and really constructed it and now you can see what it looks like it today. It did come a long way in the eight weeks though. So, reminder, you can talk to all of them. We have Daniel, well sorry, Mr. Jose, Miss Millay, Ariel, Jordan, Jalissa, and Janelle. They will be at uh, their own tables upstairs and feel free to ask them as many questions as you'd like. Thanks, you guys.